All right, everyone. So, uh, listen, I'd like to welcome everyone here to, to Clyde Road and who's dialing in uh, on the webcast or down with uh, Pauline down in Cork. And again, thanks for Pauline down in UCC for, for organising the, the group down in Cork. Um, maybe just to, for kick off, for if we can get our phones to silence, uh, emergency exit on our my left here, and then there's an attendance sheet up the top if we can all kind of sign in, that'd be great. Um, for those joining for the first time or being here for the first time, this is the Energy Environment Division. We host seven monthly lectures uh, throughout the year dealing with topics of energy consumption or the environmental effects of energy uh, supply and generation. Tonight's presentation is entitled Money Point and Ireland's Low Carbon Future and will be, will be presented by Dr Shane O'Sullivan from ESB. Um, very quickly, so Shane's an energy professional with 15 years experience in the electricity and research communities. Uh, he has a wide range of research in energy conversion systems and emissions. Uh, Shane moved on to get experience in a number of IT, trading and financial roles and still works in the energy se sector but now mainly in the area of corporate strategy and future technologies. So uh, without further ado, hand over to Shane. Thank you John and, and uh, good evening to everyone. It's um, delighted to be here. Um, I was thinking on the way in, I was thinking when the last time I addressed uh, this institution, it's probably a number of years ago, and, uh, and I, I didn't have as many people uh, either online or as here as I, I do uh, this evening, so it looks like I've chosen a, a more interesting topic uh, this, this time around, so thank you very, very much for coming, and, and thanks to everyone in uh, UCC. Oh. Sorry, could I just suggest you lower the lights a bit if you're showing slides? Yeah, so I'm going to have to yeah, hand that over to someone, maybe. I don't, I gotta get you. Alright. I know it's it's just as hard to say this place. Well perhaps you want to come up, Jerry? Yeah. Oh success. Success. Perhaps you can give it to you. Okay, so um Today I'm going to talk about Money Point in Ireland's low carbon future. I'm going to talk about the technical challenges and in, in, indeed opportunities available to Ireland as we pursue our decarbonized um, uh, future. Um, and in ESB, ESB is 90 years old uh, this year. And we've done a lot over those 90 years, but maybe our, our greatest challenges and accomplishments are yet to come as we look to the future. And we're, we're trying to create a, a brighter energy future uh, for, the, for the Irish society looking in the future. And key among that will be delivering low carbon uh, electricity <coughs> generation for the generations to come. And what I will talk to you today is about the technical options available to, uh, to us here in Ireland to deliver low carbon generation. And I'm not going to stray into policy. I'm going to try and keep it at uh, an engineering technical level. And I'm going to have uh, a specific focus on Money Point. So the first thing I'd like to do is introduce you to Money Point. And I was preparing these slides uh, yesterday, and my eight-year-old daughter came over and was asked what was going on. And she, she looked at this picture, and I explained that it was a power station in, in Clare. And she looked at it with great interest and then declared that it's very, very big. And indeed it is. Uh, Money Point is Ireland's largest uh, a single technology power station. Um, it's a pulverized fuel coal station, so it can produce 915 megawatts gross, or 855 megawatts net. And for the last three decades, it has been the backbone of the Irish electricity sector. Money Point is 30 years old this year, so happy birthday to the third unit in Money Point that was uh, built 30 years ago. And maybe I should say that it's, instead of being 30 years old, it's actually 30 years young. Because in terms of uh, coal stations, uh, Money Point is the youngest coal station on the British Island, uh, on the British Isles. Indeed, in the UK, they've had over 100 coal stations. And uh, the oldest coal station when it retired was 87 years old. So in terms of coal station life, uh, 30 years means that, that Money Point is in, in fact, it, the prime of its life. Money Point, as I said, or as my daughter put it uh, very well, it's big. Uh, it can produce over 20% of the Irish electricity demand. So on an annual basis, that's over six, six terawatt hours. 
So the last 30 years, it's been producing, on average, six terawatt hours. So it's produced over 180 terawatt hours. So in my uh, daughter's language, that's big, very big. Um, it's the equivalent of maybe six years of current electricity demand, or maybe on average 10 years over the last, over the last 30 years. So indeed, it has been the backbone of the Irish electricity sector. Also, one thing you can see from the picture is the coal yard in Money Point. And it's the possibility to store uh, over three months' worth of coal demand on site in Money Point. Indeed, if you filled up all the corners and stacked it up a bit higher, you could get over up to six months, uh, I'm told by my colleagues in Money Point. And the strategy of fuel diversification for Ireland has served it well over the last few years. There's a great reassurance uh, when it's not windy and not sunny and you know you're dependent on two pipes for bringing gas in, to look out at, see, three months coal sitting there knowing that uh, it can be called on to produce electri uh, electricity in an emergency. Indeed, the coal yard in Money Point is actually the largest single store of energy on the island of Ireland. <coughs> Also then, we look and see, consider the savings that Money Point uh, produces for the Irish consumer. So, on average, over the last number of years, and even indeed looking forward, it saves several hundred million euro for the Irish consumer uh, each year. So it depends on the swings and roundabouts of the differences between coal and gas, carbon, sterling, and dollar exchange rate. But it does save a significant amount of money to the Irish consumer. Indeed, when money point is running, the consumer is winning. But there's another side to money point. And here's a nice picture of money point. And I was going to say sunset, but it's, it's looking to the east. So I think it's the sunrise. And the other, the other side of money point is its relationship with the environment. So you can see here, we've installed five wind turbines, about 17 megawatts in total, to assist in Ireland in its decarbonization of the electricity sector. But also, we have to consider what comes out of the chimneys at Money Point. And what you can see here is water vapor. Okay? Uh, ESB has invested 368 million in state-of-the-art um, emissions control technology. So it's reduced socks and knocks and dust by over 90% uh, with this investment. And it now adheres to the strictest of emission standards uh, in Europe. What you can't see out of this photo uh, coming out of the smokestacks is its carbon dioxide emissions. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and that contributes to global warming. And Money Point is Ireland's largest point source of emissions um, on a single point. And that's for two reasons. One is because it uses coal. So coal is a high carbon intensity fuel source. And also two, because it is in my daughter's words, big. It is, the largest, it is the largest power station. So even if we converted Money Point to gas, it would still be the largest point source of carbon emissions in Ireland. So that brings me to the last number in this slide, 2025. And in my world, I, I look in strategy. And in, when I think about building things in power generation, large engineering projects. It takes of the order of five to seven years to design, plan, consent, and build a large engineering project, uh, such as any uh, future low carbon generation project <coughs> that may be considered for money point. <clears throat> In a past life, I used to trade the carbon emissions for ESB. I used to buy the number of uh, carbon emissions to meet our obligations under the European traded sector. And less than a decade ago, I was paying close to 30 euro a tonne. So while a week is a long time in politics, 10 years is certainly an era in the electricity generation. So in 10 years hence, the world can be a very, very different place. <coughs> and indeed, in, in the ESB, we recognize that. And we're aiming that by 2025, that ESB will be in a different configuration to how it is run at the moment and that will be a lower carbon configuration. So the goal for us in the, the electricity generation um, industry is to decarbonize 
but to decarbonize at least cost while maintaining a secure electricity sector. So in terms of secure electricity sector, I mean having enough infrastructure, that's the wires and also the electricity generation technology. It also means having enough uh, inertia on the system to support the, the electricity system if there's just changes in frequencies. So that's trying to maintain the synchronous 50 hertz that we operate our electricity sector at. It also means having a security of supply of the fuel that we use to power whatever the technology is, the low carbon technology, that will not be provided by renewable energy sources. So the goal is not just decarbonization, but decarbonization at least cost while maintaining a secure electricity sector. And before I go on into the details of how we may achieve that, I'm just going to bring it up to a higher level and talk about Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions and where they come from. So this is from 2015, and the electricity generation sector is marked out in blue at just under 20%, and that is part of the, the, what's called the ETS, the European Traded System. So this is a, a European-wide scheme in which the number of, uh, where every time you emit a ton of carbon dioxide, you have to buy a carbon credit to uh, allow you to do so. And there's a clear decarbonization uh, trajectory for the European traded sector into the future. Under the European ETS, the number of credits will dwindle and eventually by about 2050 or a little beyond, it'll reach zero, which means if you operate under the ETS sector, you will not be allowed to uh, emit any carbon dioxide by 2050. So the electricity generation is on the sector. It's on a clear trajectory to decarbonisation. But that maybe cannot be said for some of the other challenging areas in our greenhouse gas emissions. So we're looking to try and reduce our total emissions by the order of 80% by maybe 2050. So the other, in the energy sector, the other large emitters are in the heating and transportation sector. And it is more challenging to reduce carbon dioxide emissions there, or greenhouse gas emissions. One way that you can do it is by moving the heating and transportation sectors into the electricity generation area, or under the ETS, to bring them under the ETS, and they will, uh, therefore, be on a clear trajectory. So where I stand, I, I clearly see electricity as the decarbonization vector, or the energy vector for the future. It is on a clear path to decarbonization. And if we were to electrify heating and transport, we would also ensure that they <coughs> decarbonized along with the electricity sector. So now we look specifically at the electricity generation se sector in Ireland. And I have three graphs here are showing what 1990 and then 25 years later, 2015. And the outer ring of these shows the primary fuel input into the electricity generation sector in Ireland in those years. And you can see on the furthest uh, left that we had a, in 1990, a, a good mix <coughs> between gas, oil, peat, coal, and a very small amount of what is termed low carbon generation, which was hydro in those days. The first wind farm was built just a few years later in Bellacarig. And our electricity demand was 13 terawatt hours at the time. If we roll on 25 years later, electricity demand has more than doubled to 27 terawatt hours. And our mix has changed considerably. So the blue, the low carbon generation has increased. And this is primarily due to wind penetration. Gas has also significantly increased and oil has become almost negligible. The importance of coal or the relative importance of coal and <coughs> peat has also dwindled. Looking then at our carbon intensities, the grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, you can see that over the same 25 years, while electricity generation has doubled, our carbon intensity has halved. So as we look to the future, I don't know what the electricity demand will be. I can say that there's a challenge between energy efficiencies and growing the economy. There's also the possibility of the electrification of the heating and transport sector. So if you move 300,000 uh, vehicles to become electric vehicles, that would add about a terawatt hour to demand. 
Also, there's data centers, and a 150 megawatt data center would also add a terawatt hour of uh, electricity demand. So demand can stay the same if energy efficiencies work out, but probably, if I was a betting man, I'd say that would increase as we electrify heating and transport and increase the number of data centers. Also, we're on this trajectory to decarbonize our entire energy, our entire society. And that means that the electricity sector may be one of the first to be decarbonized, as it is the easiest to look at specific point sources of uh, emissions. So sometime between now and 2050, maybe that's as early as 2030, if you're an optimistic, uh, or maybe if you're more pessimistic, 20, 2050. But if I go for 2040 is the year that we have to decarbonize our electricity generation sector. That conveniently is another 25 years after the year I put up here. So in the first 25 years from 1990 to 2015, we've doubled our electricity demand and halved our emissions. And that has been done to changing our fuel sources, adding the amount of renewables. But in the next 25 years from 2015, we have to take a ginormous step of completely eradicating, or as near as possible, the carbon intensity of our generation sector, and as well as dealing with an unknown but probably increased electricity demand into the future. So this is no easy task. So, but there are options available to us to decarbonize the electricity sector. And I've grouped these into four uh, low carbon generation options what I've termed res plus storage, so that's renewable energy supplies plus storage, nuclear, CCS is carbon capture and storage, and biomass. And it is incumbent in my job <coughs> in ESB that we systematically <coughs> examine all the possibilities out there, all these options from uh, a low carbon generation point of view, from a technical point of view, to examine the ins and outs they all have pros and cons associated with them. There is no one clear winner. If I look at the amount of renewables that are on the system, we have made fantastic inroads, predominantly with onshore wind. And onshore wind is by far the cheapest way we have in Ireland to decarbonize the electricity sector. It costs of the order of 80 euro per megawatt hour to support wind, but we also then need to pay of the order of 20 euro per megawatt hour to integrate that into our electricity sector in terms of additional infrastructure and networks and also providing the backup power for when it's not, not windy enough. So there's, there's over 3.3 gigawatts of wind installed on the island of Ireland and just last week we had a new record of over 3 gigawatts of electricity being provided by wind uh, at a particular half hour. So there's other renewable energy sources as well as wind, geothermal, uh, hydro, on and offshore wind, and ocean energy technologies, tidal and wave, and of course solar. I have no doubt that these will all make inroads in to help us to decarbonize our electricity sector into the future. But of the mature technologies that are available in renewables, they have the same, what could be perceived flaw, in that they are intermit uh, intermittent and they, are n they cannot be sure when and when, uh, where the sun will shine or the wind will blow. So in the holy grail scenario, we would have enough storage to store this renewable energy for a day that maybe it, it isn't blowing or sunny enough. So in terms of storage, I definitely see it as being a very important part of the electricity sector going forward, but maybe not the panacea that some would envisage it to be. So if you were to take, for example, one day's worth of electricity demand, and say you wanted to store enough renewable energy in Ireland to cover the next day when maybe it won't be as uh, sunny or windy, then in broad terms you're probably looking at building the equivalent of 60 Turlock Hills of costing between half a billion and a billion euro each, if you could find all the hills. Alternatively, you could electrify four million vehicles and hug them up to the grid to supply the energy from those batteries in the vehicles. 
That's twice the number of cars that we currently have on the road, and no one would be able to drive the next day if we did that. Alternatively, you've heard that batteries are falling in price, and indeed they are. So to put maybe some context on that, you would require about 14 million Tesla Powerwalls. It's equivalent to giving every household in Ireland eight of them. So these numbers are quite, quite large. And so when I look at storage as maybe providing the one way that we could continue to use intermittent renewables, I see it as being part of the picture, but not maybe, maybe not all of the picture. So when I look at uh, renewables and storage and take a step back, there's going to be limits on the amount of renewables that we can integrate into our system. There's technical limits in terms of finding good sites for wind energy. There's societal limits in terms of where and when we would, uh, where we would allow wind farms to be built. There's also economic limits. As we add each marginal megawatt of wind, it becomes more and more expensive to integrate that in to our system. So at some stage with wind, and then maybe the next most mature technology, maybe we're moving offshore or maybe solar, <coughs> but at some stage we will have had reached our feasible limit on the amount of renewables that we can integrate into the system. And if I was guess that to be somewhere in the region of maybe 50 to 60% of our total electricity demand. And we're well on the way to achieving our 2020 target, which is 40%. So sometime in the next decade, we may well have reached a figure of maybe 50% of renewables. So then the question becomes, what's next? How can we decarbonize the rest of the Irish electricity sector once we've reached this technical, societal, or economic limit on how much renewables we can have while taking storage. And that brings me to the other options on the screen. Nuclear. So yes, ESB has looked at the technical ins and outs of nuclear generation, but no, we have no plans to build nuclear power in Ireland. And I'm going to have to do a Donald Trump here and say, no, we have absolutely none, <laughs> no plans to build nuclear power in Ireland. Indeed, nuclear power is prohibited uh, in Ireland. So in the 1999 Electricity Act, uh, you will not be granted an electricity generation license if you produce, uh, to produce electricity from nuclear fission. But there was a loophole there that meant you could still build a power plant. So in 2006, in the Strategic Infrastructure Act, uh, it was deemed that you would change so that you would not be allowed to get the planning permission for a nuclear power station in Ireland. But even setting aside that it's prohibited, we can just, we look, because we're interested in where nuclear power is, is being built, and that's in England, a, a, a country that we trade electricity with. And England has decided to build its first nuclear power station in several decades at Hinkley Point. This structure will be the most expensive building ever built in history, and it will provide 3.2 gigawatts of electricity when complete. On an annualized basis, this one station will, build, will power uh, provide enough electricity as we consume in Ireland in one entire year. It's going to be big. Also, when you look at that through the technology that's involved, the generator and um, turbine are of the order of 1.6 gigawatts. So if we transpose that onto the Irish system, it would be three times the size of the largest single infeed <laughs> on the Irish system. So you simply cannot accommodate the, what is tec technically and commercially available in nuclear power on the Irish system. So moving on, I come to one of my favourite subjects, which is carbon capture and storage. And I've borrowed a picture here uh, from my friends in the Scottish Centre for Carbon Storage. And what CCS is, is carbon capture and then storing it underground. So in this picture, you can see that the power station is located in the middle, and that it's fueled either from the top left from coal shown in underground, underground coal mining or open cast coal mining, or alternatively like by gas shown here on the, on the right as a, a, a offshore uh, gas rig. So this power station is a conventional power station, 
It takes the fuel, converts it into steam, it drives a turbine that drives a generator. But as well as being a normal power station, in CCS you have the, an extra chemistry kit that scrub, takes the exhaust gas and takes out the carbon dioxide from it as a pure stream of carbon dioxide. This is then compressed either into a dense phase gas or even li liquid CO2 and it is pumped to an underground location shown here by this kind of bubble and we're looking for kind of a sandstone structure, a porous structure that would allow the carbon dioxide to be injected and then some kind of cap rock on top of it that would prevent it from migrating somewhere that you don't want it to go. So the idea is that you're taking the carbon dioxide out, out of the, the, the flue gas and injecting it underground where it will not go anywhere. So the good thing about carbon, uh, carbon capture and storage is that it's fuel agnostic. <coughs> so you could burn any fuel from coal and gas shown here to peat or biomass and you can take the carbon dioxide out of the exhaust stream and put it underground. This technology is not new. Uh, the first patent was in 1930. And ever since, it's been used in a variety of industries. Indeed, thanks to the chairman, I have a nice glass of fizzy water ahead in front of me. And when you think about fizzy water, what's causing the bubbles is carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide probably came from a carbon capture plant operating off a flue gas. So this technology is not new, and it does work. It's used extensively in gas processing to in take out carbon dioxide where it's mixed with natural gas before injecting it at higher quality into the gas grid. Also, the pipelines, there's over 6,000 kilometers of pipelines of CO2 pipelines in the United States. So moving it around is not a challenge. Injecting it underground <coughs> then brings you into the territory of oil and gas exploration, where things are done in terms of probabilities. The Norwegians have been storing, storing CO2 underground for the last 20 years to save it going into the atmosphere. So it also, storing it underground is also technically doable. So I'd love to go into this in more detail today because I have been involved in a number of CCS projects, but I've been asked uh, to talk about specifically about biomass. For I'm going to leave this then here, but I'd be welcome if I was invited back. I'd love to talk about this another time. What I will say is that CCS is completely feasible. Technology-wise, it's not a problem. Where it does have challenges are on the cost side of things. You take a significant efficiency hit when you apply carbon capture onto your power station. You also then have to consider the full chain and who operates uh, each part of that. So from ESB's perspective, we like to operate power stations. We'd probably be able to operate a carbon capture plant. But in terms of pipelines and networks, maybe that's someone else, and in terms of offshore rigs or storage underground, that's probably into the oil and gas territory. So you may find yourself with a number of companies from different industries involved, and then at each stage you have a different contractual interface and lots of fun for the lawyers. So from an engineering perspective, it's a challenge, but it's completely feasible. So currently where the challenge lays, lies is more on the commercial side, um, ensuring that the necessary support politically and regulatory, legally, are there to facilitate carbon and capture and storage. Looking to the future, carbon capture and storage would be vital for decarbonizing our societies. It is the only technology available that can decarbonize industrial emissions from industrial processes. And it's also, in my view, uh, required to decarbonize the electricity sector in certain countries, including in Ireland. But that's for more detail for another time. So looking back at the four options I've outlined, the next one on my list is biomass. But before I get there, I'm going to mention two other ones. And that's gas and interconnectors. 
there is a nice picture of pool bag again maybe at sunrise the combined cycle of pool bag one of our finest machines in terms of gas and low carbon generation we can ad again address it in terms of decarbonization at least cost while ensuring a secure electricity sector so the first one decarbonization gas is a low carbon fuel source if we were to burn it into a highly efficient car, uh, CCGT, we can expect emissions intensities of the order of 350 grams per kilowatt hour, which is quite good. But is it good enough? So maybe in the future world where we <coughs> hit this, maybe 50% uh, of renewables integration, maybe we can add and say that the other 50% will be high efficient uh, CCGTs. But at that stage, you've brought yourself down to maybe 175 grams per kilowatt hour. So that's a floor that you can't get past unless you use CCS. So gas without CCS in terms of CCGTs is probably a bridging technology in terms of decarbonization. Next on the list was affordability. And CCGTs are quite cheap and fast to build, relatively speaking. And last is ensuring a secure electricity sector. So gas, gas turbines, they do provide a lot of inertia on the system to maintain 50 hertz. They are quite flexible and very efficient. But their fuel source is gas. And coming from strategy, 2020, 2025, it's already in my rearview mirror. So if we went and looked at 2030, carb will probably have dwindled out by then, and Kinsale may well have closed. So coming to 2030, we may well find ourselves dependent from our, for our fuel, for our gas stations, solely on imports from a country that may well have left the European Union. So in terms of a secure electricity sector, we, we would have to ask ourselves, is relying on gas for maybe 50% of electricity generation, imported gas. Is that somewhere where we as a nation would want to be? I don't know. The next one on the list, interconnectors. So I, I like this picture because it looks like a giant plug. And that effectively is what an interconnector is, joining two networks. So Ireland has a number of interconnectors. Uh, so we interconnect us to Northern Ireland, which is a different jurisdiction, it counts as an interconnector in European term language. The island itself is interconnected to Great Britain in terms of the Moyle interconnector and the East-West interconnector in North Dublin. So again, we can consider interconnectors in terms of decarbonisation at least cost by maintaining a secure electricity sector. So decarbonisation, well, you're importing electricity, so the carbon emissions are someone else's problems. If your morals and ethics are high and you say, I want to insist on it being decarbonized or low carbon generation, then they have to choose from one of these four options and you'll be paying them to install one of these low carbon technologies rather than doing it yourself. In terms of affordability, Interconnectors do have an advantage in terms of trading electricity between two jurisdictions. They may well serve to reduce cost to consumers. Um, but you have to be very careful in analyzing the total costs to society. You're looking for the cost-benefit analysis. So the benefits would increase trading and reducing prices for consumers would be quite good with interconnectors. But interconnectors don't come cheap. And you have to consider what their total impact is on the entire energy sector, not just the electricity energy sector. <laughs> also in terms of security of supply, long distance interconnectors tend to be DC, so they don't provide inertia or synchronous gen generation. Also interconnectors, while they do have quite a high availability, they can and do fail. So in the last year, we've seen issues with the interconnector to the Aran Islands, the EWIC, and also with Moyle, and between Britain and France. These problems are more difficult to solve when the wire is uh, embedded in the ground on the seabed. Also then, in terms of interconnectors, if you do interconnect, 
you're also going to need your own generation just in case the interconnector does fail or goes down for maintenance. So you, in terms of countries around the world, no country goes naked in terms of generation. It always has enough generation uh, in its country to meet its, uh, its own generation uh, needs. So in reality, we may well find ourselves doubling up on our requirements, generation requirements, but there may well be good economic justification for doing so. But we have to examine all the technical and economic uh, arguments for interconnectors. So that brings me to biomass. And I was asked here by Engineers Ireland to talk about biomass and talk specifically about the, the option of burning biomass in Money Point. The options for CCS is also possible in Money Point, as is renewables and storage. And I showed you a photo of the wind farms that we have installed in uh, Money Point. But I'm now going to talk about specifically about the the economic challenges, or sorry, the technical and engineering challenges associated with trying to convert money point to biomass. And to assist me, I have this nice drawing of money point. And the easiest way to describe what would be required in engineering terms to convert or co fire biomass in money point is to follow <coughs> the fuel as it would pass through the power station. So the first thing is that we're probably looking at imports of biomass if we were to convert money point to biomass. Probably wood pellets, which are an engineering, engineering um, or engineered biomass <coughs> where uh, woody residues and uh, saw, sawdust from timber mills is compressed to reduce its moisture content and also to increase its uh, volumetric energy density so that it can be transported so this is a coal ship being uh, moored alongside a money point. And again, like everything in money point, it's big. It's 300 meters long, but maybe 50 meters wide, 150,000 tons of coal in one shipment. If we were look to take a shipment of biomass, we're probably looking at smaller ships, maybe Panamax or handy sized vessels. And that automatically means an increase in the number of the shipments. Also, with biomass, its energy density would be less than that of coal. So for the same energy output, we'd need more uh, uh, volumetric input. So again, a logistics question has to be addressed in terms of actually taking delivery of the ships. We also then have to unload the ships. So here's a grab from Money Point. You can lift over 20 tonnes in each lift of coal out of the hold. And you can see that the hatches are left open here. So with wood pellets, unfortunately, they don't like the West Clare weather as much as coal, and you have to avoid getting them wet. So that means that your unloader will probably have to be a pneumatic unloader or maybe a screw unloader to get it out of the boat as quick as you can so that the, the ship can sail again. We then have to transport the coal from the, the jetty up to wherever it's going to be stored. And a few challenges here. Biomass in the form of wood pellets is quite abrasive. So that prov provides an engineering challenge in its own. It also means that the number of ATEX zones in areas where you have to be very careful about explosions would increase in money point. And you have to take that into consideration. And you also have to make sure that it's covered and kept uh, safe from the elements. You also then have to look at storage of this. So this is the coal yard in Money Point where the coal is just stored outside. It doesn't matter if it gets wet. And uh, you can get it off the ship quickly, store it, and then take it as and when you need it. But for wood pellets, again, you need to keep it in a weathertight container. And you also have to be careful of the release of volatile gases as you uh, store a lot of biomass wood pellets together. So this is a photo from Drax, which is a coal station in the UK that's converted three of its six um, units to biomass. And here you see its storage of about 80,000 tons of biomass wood pellets uh, in something that's about 50 or 60 meters in diameter and 50 meters tall. 
You then are trying to grind, <coughs> grind the wood pellets. So you want to mimic the property of coal as close as possible. So money point is currently a pulverized fuel, uh, a pulverized coal station. And what you do is use this, which is a ball and tube mill. So there's eight tons of steel balls that rotate around in a rotating cylinder that crush the coal into extremely fine particles that can be then brought in to your boiler. The problem with this type of mill for biomass or for wood pellets is that it tends not to suspend the wood pellets rather than to actually crush them into finer particles. So if we were to convert money points, there would be a significant engineering challenge in changing the mills uh, to um, try and break down the particles of biomass into something that can be injected into the boiler. So that brings us to the burners themselves. So this is where <coughs> air and the fuel are injected into the boiler. So these were designed with coal in mind. So the properties of how biomass would flow through them would have to be examined in great detail to ensure that the burners could accommodate uh, the biomass fuel. Then there is a combust combustion process itself within the boiler. And the physical, chemical, and dynamic properties of a particle of biomass as it combusts are going to be different to that of coal. And the boiler we have in Money Point was designed with coal in mind and has operated successfully for coal for the last 30 years. White wood pellets have, uh, tend to have a larger particle size and maybe are more vo volatile in their combustion and have a quicker char burnout. So the, fl the flame ball, the fireball within the boiler may be in a different location and you may have to think long and hard about how you're extracting the heat energy out of the boiler and you may have to reconfigure the boiler. You have to also be very careful of this, which is slagging and fouling on pipes. So anything like this would inhibit the heat transfer between uh, the bo in the boiler to the steam. And ESB, we've been burning peat for 50 years before we moved on to a different technology of, of um, fluidized beds in the last decade. And we thought that we knew everything there was to know about peat. But when we moved to this new technology, we found that there was extra corrosion issues to be involved that we hadn't envisaged because we changed our technology. <coughs> Similarly, for this, if we kept the technology but changed our fuel, we have to have exact specifications of what that fuel would be if in terms of wood, wood pellet biomass. And we'd also have to monitor very carefully the combustion and the products of combustion to ensure that we don't have any issues like this. Then we get to the back end, and this is where um, the combustion, the products of combustion, the flu, flu gases are treated. So there's fl flu gas desulfurization and selective catalytic reduction. So the first is to deal with the amount of SOX within the, the flue gas from coal, and the second to deal with NOx. There's also filters to reduce the amount of particulates and smoke that <coughs> is emitted. So the good news about wood pellets is that they have no, very little sulfur in them. So we can do away with the flue gas desulfurization and save on OPEX costs. There's also ways of configuring the boiler to reduce the amount of primary NOx formation. And then that means you can also maybe reduce the amount of layers you need in your selective catalytic reductor. So in terms overall of a conversion or partial firing of money point on biomass, it's not without its challenges. It is going to actually indeed be extremely challenging for engineers to figure out, if we were to go down this road, what the ins and outs would be it's not quite as simple as just whistling up a ship of biomass instead of coal. There are going to be significant engineering challenges with any biomass conversion. <coughs> also, when we talk about biomass, we have to consider the non-engineering aspects associated with that. 
And chief among them is the question of sustainability. If burning biomass in a power station is not sustainable, then there is no point in doing it. Our goal is to decarbonize at least cost while maintaining a secure electricity sector. So if we do not achieve decarbonization, there's no point in embarking on this road. Now, the issue of sustainability and deciding or calculating if it is sustainable is extremely complex. The way I put it is that there is inherently good biomass and there's inherently bad biomass. And it is possible, though complex, to calculate the sustainability, or otherwise, of a biomass fuel supply. And you have to take account of that fuel supply and how or where and where it is burnt. There's also maybe cultural issues when we consider sustainability. If I was to talk to you about forests, you may view a forest as an amenity, somewhere to go for a walk with your family. And in Ireland, we talk about afforestation, trying to increase the percentage of forests that we have, up from the current 11%. In other countries, forestry is considered a crop where it's grown for sale to sawmills for use in producing lumber. And then the residue and the sawdust can be made into uh, white wood pellets for sale to the biomass industry. So we have to consider as well maybe what we consider to be um, biomass and agricultural products. People in other cultures and other countries may have a different view. But in terms of sustainabilities, a lot of people have considered this, a lot of experts and more expert than I have considered this. And the European Union has just <coughs> proposed very strict and very challenging criteria that you must meet to prove that whatever it is that you want to use in turn and call biomass is indeed sustainable. Another word that I have up there is indigenous. And I suppose when we consider biomass, I've talked here about what would probably be a significant fraction of biomass would be imported if you were to convert money point. But People like to think of using indigenous biomass, and indeed, that would be a good idea at, when you look at it first. But in terms of biomass, what matters more is not where it's grown, but how it's grown, and ensuring that it is grown in a sustainable manner. The transportation of the biomass to wherever it's going to be ultimately used has also to be factored in. But in terms of shipments by boat, it is, relatively speaking, a low carbon transportation method. Also, we have to consider the costs of this. So there's capex and opex costs. And what it is depends on how much you're doing, whether you want to retain co-firing facilities or a full conversion, what timelines you're looking at for doing this. What I would say about it is that when we look to Britain and Drax, the coal station that is converted to biomass that we saw in a previous picture. Uh, they require revenues of the order of 100 pounds a megawatt hour, which is about 115 to 120 euro per megawatt hour. <coughs> and I'd envisage that if we were to convert money point, we'd probably need something within that envelope as well. So the non-engineering considerations are complex and they're are many. But there are many countries also that have examined this issue and grappled with it and tried to decide with how they can decarbonize their own electricity sector. And many of them have gone down the route of choosing to use biomass in the electricity sector. Denmark, England, as I mentioned, Belgium, Nor um, Netherlands, Japan. When you're looking at using potentially <coughs> biomass in the electricity sector, it is by far cheaper to reuse an existing solid fuel station, such as a peat or coal station, than it is to build a new power station dedicated to biomass. In the UK, they're building a 300 megawatt uh, white wood pellet biomass station, and it's costing them 650 million pounds sterling just on the capital outlay. So you can save between 70 and 90% of those costs if you reuse an existing asset. <coughs> So you'll be glad to hear this is my last slide. 
and it's not, uh, most of it is something that you've seen before. So you should not underestimate the challenge of decarbonizing our electricity sector and indeed our entire society. Renewables and storage are by far the cheapest way to do it at the moment. Onshore wind, we should fill our boots and take as much as we can as that, as long as it is economic to do so. And that maybe brings us up to somewhere in the 50 to 60 percent range. And then we have to ask, ask ourselves, what, what's going to decarbonize the rest of our electricity sector? And if we can crack that nut, if we can decarbonize our entire electricity sector, then we can build, bring in transportation and heating and electrify them and bring them into our decarbonized electricity sector. When I do look at the future, and I look at this, there's uncertainty about which of these options is best for Ireland, which of them technology-wise is better than another one. And the answer is there's no one simple, simple silver bullet here. What we have to do in Ireland is look at the optimal mix for us, for our, 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 our needs, and deciding what the future is. We're looking into the future with uncertainty in terms of what the political structure will be. What, what will happen our nearest neighbor neighbor what well, we, we would say is that we're probably looking at trying to reduce our reliance on have on a single third party in the future and increasing our fuel independence probably also looking at increasing the amount of generation that we have on the island but the rate at which our demand and electricity will increase and the rate <coughs> at which it will decarbonize is uncertain and some people, when they hear the word uncertain, they think fear. I hear the word uncertainty, and I think challenge, opportunity. So the future for us is not clear. There are options available to us as we look to the future. Indeed, all of them, bar nuclear, which is prohibited, are possible in money point, and indeed in the wider electricity sector. And as I look to the future, and I look to, for ESB maybe to lead our transition and bring us on our journey to our low carbon future. I look at Money Point and I look at how well it's been doing for the last 30 years. And I see no reason why it can't continue for the next 30 years to be uh, the lo a low carbon generation backbone of the Irish electricity sector as we look to decarbonize at least cost by maintaining a secure electricity sector. Thank you. Now, thanks, William Shane. A fantastic and very informative presentation. Um, at this stage, maybe put it to the floor. If there's any questions? On the straight away. So you might just make wait for the microphone. Yeah. So um, if we have a bundle of questions, maybe we can package them up in, a, in twos or threes. So. And Dermot Foley, uh, you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, volatile compounds in, in the biomass. How much problem are they? I might take maybe <coughs> a couple of questions out of go. Uh, assuming there is another question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure yeah. Yeah. I've um, you saw a lot of difference in energy density between biomass and coal. Can you uh, put some figures on that, please? Uh, Shane, I've one here in from the uh, group in uh, UCC, uh, uh, Paul Dean. Uh, the presentation, the presentation, sorry, the the proposed revision of the renewable energy directive states that to be to be. Sorry, that uh, to make a contribution to renewable energy targets, new biomass electricity generation plants must be high efficiency cogeneration, a seventy percent efficiency plus. Will money point conversion to biomass qualify under this proposed criteria? And that's from Paul Dean in UCC. Okay, three good questions there. So hopefully, I can give three good answers. Dermot, you're asking about the, the volatility. So there's two aspects maybe we have to consider that. The first is in the storage, the transportation and storage of the biomass. And you may 
you have to monitor very carefully the temperature of how you and the temperature in the biomass because it can self-combust and explode. So usually that storage is in an inner atmosphere. Also then when you actually do get it into your boiler, the volatiles, they're driven off, they're the first to be driven off and that changes your combustion chemistry. So you have to undertake computational fluid dynamic analysis to see how and where the energy is released in your boiler. So it's another, it's another fuel type, it's, it's chemical and properties and its combustion properties are going to be different, but it's just another engineering challenge. Second question was uh, asking about the energy density of uh, biomass, maybe relative to coal. So why wood pellets are of the order of 16 to 17 gigajoules per tonne, and coal is maybe 24 for the, the, the hard coal that we use here. So it's maybe a quarter less in terms of energy density relative to coal. And the question from UCC, so I have to look at the camera here, Dress Paul there, no Paul. So your question is on the, the, the winter package and the, the proposed revision to the uh, Renewable Energy Directive where it talks about using biomass in the most efficient way possible. So in terms of uh, electricity generation, that would be in CHB, combined heat and power, where after you've used the, the biomass to produce uh, electricity, then the uh, steam can then be used or the, to heat and maybe some industrial process or district heating. So no different to any power station now, we'd, we'd love to, to sell our energy twice, if you will, so in form of electricity and also if, if there was a heat load customer. But in Ireland, it's, it's kind of difficult to get uh, a heat load customer. So when you look at these proposals, uh, and they are just proposals, they're from the Commission and they have to go through the process of being ratified, it would create challenges for us, but that's just another one of the complexities that we have in life. More questions? Right? Uh, is the is the, yeah the microphone's on Kevin O'Rourke. Um, just actually to follow up on the point about energy density, I think the, the contrast is somewhat greater because the bulk density, I think, of the biomass will be lower than that of coal, so that the energy per cubic meter, the ratio will be even uh, less, if you, or, if you like, the, yeah, l even less relative to coal than, than, than the case per kilogram. Uh, my question is, is in relation to the matter of indigenous versus imported and the whole question of um, the, pro the prospect even of having a supply chain indigenously that could meet the sort of um, demand that, that, that Money Point would call for. Uh, the, uh, my understanding is that some studies done in recent years indicated that it would be quite some time, a matter of a couple of decades perhaps, before um, even at the 130 euro per ton, say we call it tariff uh, offering, uh, that, I, that that indigenous supply would be able to, to actually compete against international supply. Now that's independent, of course, of land use and those other issues that you I think you would LULUC, which I think was to do with land use considerations. Uh, but I just wonder, would you care to comment on that and the prospect of indigenous uh, versus um, uh, imported? Any other question on that topic? Um, yeah, uh, good evening, to Tom Burton. Um, I, 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 I don't know if there's any diplomatic way for me to say my opinion, but uh, it is just an opinion and, and uh, I, I, I respect speakers that come here and share their opinion. Um, but but no, for me, the, the, this, um, I, 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 would, I, w I would very much like to see more forward thinking and leadership uh, in terms of the evolution of technologies and R&D coming forward uh, as these solutions emerge. And uh, I hope you'll accept it as some constructive criticism, which I'm, I'm loath to do, but you, you did say you're looking at 2025 in your rear view mirror, and uh, I, I see a lot of change and new options coming online in these areas, um, particularly biomass, and I, I'd, li I'd like to see the option of torrefaction, for example, being looked at uh, would solve many of your engineering challenges, in theory anyway. 
Um, so, so just um, anyway, th thanks for taking my opinion. Uh, Charles Sonnesworth, just talking about the imported or, or not, uh, talk about imported fuel. Given that uh, there are other much larger countries uh, going into this, uh, and you talk about DRAX, uh, and you talked about a number of other European countries, is there going to be any sustainable source of biomass left for us to buy? Okay. I might take those three questions and come back to you, Dennis, in a minute. So I take your point about uh, maybe density in terms of volumetric or mass density. Agree there. So the prospect for indigenous biomass. So the first is where you're going to grow it and then where you're going to use it and uh, applying the sustainability criteria there. So your first question is maybe on the economics of it. Also then, when I was talking about the technical options and money points and really the, the type of biomass, as I mentioned, you, you want to be strict on your specification for the biomass and really for converting a pulverized fuel sta uh, coal station such as this, you're looking at woody biomass and the kind of the offcuts from the, the timber industry. So you're probably looking maybe instead of maybe some of the other crops that are being talked about, such as uh, willow and miscanthus. Uh, there's other technologies out there that, that can be used to uh, maybe release the energy content of, that, of those particular fuel types. Uh, but in terms of a pulverized coal uh, boiler and trying to convert that, you're probably looking at the, the woody sector. Um, and in Ireland, the afforestation rates of the order of 11% and increasing. Um, and then you have to take into account the, the economics. There's a hierarchy at which wood is used in the economics of wood. So the first is that it goes towards uh, the lumber industry. And then you know the, it's the, what remains and sawdust can be compressed uh, to maybe pellet board. And then finally, anything that's left over can go towards maybe uh, use for combustion and biomass. So there is a, an economic hierarchy, and you have to take that into account that you know, whoever is converting to are looking at using biomass uh, in white wood pellets probably can't pay the same price as uh, that those uh, industries higher up uh, the food chain in terms of wood use. So in terms of indigenous supply, um, I could see some uh, but maybe, probably not the vast majority uh, of um, kind of white wood pellets uh, if you were to go down the route of supply and money point. The second question then, so Tom, you're asking about R&D, um, and I suppose there I'd say, yes, there's a, a loads of, um, uh, a lot of research being undertaken in terms of trying to develop new technologies, uh, low carbon generation technologies, and there's a lot of exciting things that, that we, we look at and we do look at in biomass and other technologies. But I suppose it, when I look at, I'm looking at the mature technology, something that maybe, you know, we could p design and plan to build now that would be there in the order of five to seven years time. So in my world, uh, like hope that a development, that a new technology that is promising would reach uh, full maturity to be implemented at scale. Well, hope is not a strategy. Um, I suppose, you mentioned specifically the tar faction or advanced uh, uh, biomass, or, um, so steam exploded pellets, for example, or torrified wood. And the idea here is that the um, the wood pellets are, are are made and processed differently to, to break down the filaments within them to try and mimic the properties of coal uh, more directly. And that um, the manufacturers of these uh, who are looking at this um, indicate that it could be used in our boil mill, uh, ball and tube mills without any modification. And if so, that would be great. Um, what we haven't seen is any example out there uh, of uh, ball and tube mill. And the uh, availability of advanced biomass is somewhat limited at the moment. But if it came on stream and large uh, amounts of sustainable advanced biomass were available, you know, we'd love to avoid the the cost if we went down this road of, of having to exchange our, our uh, mills for a different type of technology. So yeah, I'd say that the, there is a lot of R&D undertake, being undertaken and, and we follow it with great interest and hope. 
Uh, but I suppose when we're looking at the electricity sector, we look, look more, focus more on mature technologies that can be delivered uh, maybe in the, the nearer term. So the last question there of those three O was a question about imported uh, biomass and if a lot of other countries uh, choose to import their biomass, would there be any left uh, for uh, Money Point or other power stations in Ireland if we chose to go down that route? So that's a question of supply and demand and supply and demand will interact to find whatever their price point is at which they'll meet. So you could find that if there isn't enough uh, supply that maybe uh, the price would increase and therefore then there'll be less demand. So the economics would be at play to, to find out the level playing ground. But you also find that as, as the price increases that maybe the supply would increase as people see more opportunity. So what's more important though is ensuring that it is sustainable and following the criteria. So you have to take into account uh, as well as how and where it's grown, it's how it's transported and where it ultimately is being used. So they are covered under the strict criteria that the, the EU has proposed. Um, so there is a significant logistics chain uh, associated with the importation of anything, uh, and anything in bulk, even coal that we currently use, or if we were to look at biomass, um, it is possible to sign long-term contracts for the supply of fuels and it's a question of who takes the risk and who takes the, the risk reward balance in that. So again, another challenge. Uh, uh, Darren, uh, just a few comments. One is when the, we bought the boilers money point we were assured that use any type of coal. We went over to, to Foster Wheeler with 24 coals that we'd been offered at the most competitive offers we had. And after day one, we identified that none of them were suitable for the boiler. And the only thing it could apparently burn was gas oil. Now, uh, shall we say we moved on from there, but uh, getting manufacturers to accept uh, fuels of different specifications is not trivial, uh, but it can be done. And certainly tracks have clearly shown at the boiler end how it can be done. On the question of indigenous versus imported, money point is imported full stop. If we have indigenous biomass, we should be using it in the peat stations. They can use wood chips where money point can't, so it's a much easier process in the wood stations. The query I have is, you alluded and you've studied CCS and biomass. The question is, on a cost per megawatt hour basis, what do you see as the relativity? in terms of their relative attractiveness, given that neither of them are terribly attractive compared with the sources we have at the moment. No, it's, it's different. Hello, Shane. Uh, Dennis Dove from Better Environment with Nuclear Energy. Um, I would like to talk to you about biomass, but as an engineer, my eye is drawn to the X. I was always asked, in my, stud in my exams to find X. But you also, I, th I think one of the reasons why you have an X beside the nuclear is, as you mentioned, the Hinkley Point, which everybody accepts is far too large and far too expensive for a country the size of Ireland. But as a nuclear, s as a strategist, an energy strategist for electricity supply board, I wonder would you be concerned that one of the co-funders of Hinkley Point project is, it is um, they also have a small reactor about to be commissioned in the next 12 months, uh, the pebble bed modular reactor, which is 100% fail safe, passive safety, and a lot cheaper than anything that Hinkley Point is likely to produce. And as a strategist, would you be concerned that they could find a way in here, producing safe, clean electricity as a competitor to ESB, uh, thereby sidelining the ESB from an affordable low carbon option on top of the 50% renewables. And alternatively, if our policy was to change, would the ESB consider such a possibility? Uh, uh, Donald Kassan, Gas Networks Ireland. Uh, Shane, I'd like to uh, congratulate you on a very uh, excellent presentation and a uh, very informative. But um, I suppose my, my question and my comment is on your low carbon generation options, 
I think you're missing one, and that is biomethane or biogas. You know, we, we, you, know you, you had a statistic there that we could move to, I think it was 170 uh, grams of CO2 per, uh, per, um, per megawatt hour generated. And uh, there is a potential to bring that down to zero using potentially indigenously produced biomethane which is a direct drop-in replacement using the gas grid, using the existing, um, you know, underutilized power generation plant we have on the grid today. So my comment, I suppose, I think, you know, the, um, the, the low-carbon or the, the decarbonizing options is probably not one or other of any of the ones you've put up there. It's probably a combination and probably, probably includes some that you don't have up there and uh, I'd, I'd put biomethane or bio, biogas into that, uh, into that mix. I think maybe we should finish at that, shouldn't we? Are there any? We'll have to maybe just take one or two more questions, if somebody has them, but if not, yeah, okay. I might, I might answer those three good questions first before we take the, the final take, ones. Okay. <coughs> so, Jerry, um, levelized cost of electricity, I think, is what you're asking me from. And as a metric, you know, it's one of many that we can use to assess uh, new power generation projects. So we're looking for some specifics. So as I, as I mentioned, uh, a biomass conversion project, if you were to do it in money points, would of, be the, of the same order as Drax, be 115 to 120 euro per megawatt hour. A new builds biomass project would be more expensive. Um, and you can look to Britain to see some of the supports that they give there. In terms of CCS, um, you have to remember that as well, it, the carbon capture is a technology, but the rest of it, the, the pipeline, it varies in lengths depending on the ge geology there, and also uh, where you're going to store it, how deep it is, how far offshore if it, it, it is. So in terms of CCS, there's no one figure because as well as the, the technology <coughs> challenge, um, such as the, the capture plant, you have to take into account something that varies by, by location. What I would say, though, is if you look to, to Britain, there's a Carbon Capture and Storage Association that have come out and said that for £95 per uh, megawatt hour, that they reckon they could build uh, a gas plant with CCS and produce uh, low carbon <coughs> electricity from that. So I'd probably go and say, well, they're probably a little bit they're on the optimistic side. There, there are costs, the, the, the capital costs associated with the chemistry kit to, to scrub out the CO2 from the exhaust stream, and those costs are falling. So the first power project uh, to use CCS was Boundary Dam in Canada, and they reckon that um, having done, completed the project, they reckon that if they were to do it again, they could do it at, at, with a capex of 30% less uh, than uh, what they, they actually did first time. They learned from doing it what they could improve upon. So like any technology, the capture component of it, I see prices dropping as it is rolled out. And I think it will be a question of uh, when and not if in terms of uh, CCS. We have to then also take into account for a particular project, the specifics associated with it, and whether you can reuse any existing infrastructure, pipelines or platforms that may be there, and then also the offshore uh, element of it and storage deep underground, which has uh, more of a natural variation than just a, a technical variation. So Dennis, you were asking about nuclear and the X on my graph. So what I would say is that it is policy at the moment. It's nuclear power is prohibited in Ireland. So it's not a question for us to, to examine uh, nuclear power. I've thrown up the technical options that I see that is possible on the island of Ireland. And again, there are the promise of technologies coming out, such as the pebble bed reactor or small modular reactors coming out in the future that may well be suitable for Ireland. But I don't know. I can't. Those don't exist now. There's nowhere now where you can go and look and see that technology. And in terms of nuclear power, prohibited, so it isn't a question that arises uh, for Ireland at the moment. And the last question then, Donald, yeah, um, biomethane, I think, you know, that is one of the future options available. Um, I didn't mean to exclude it. In, in my world, biomass 
covers uh, a multitude. And you have to think then, you know, if there is the, the availability and the cost of producing it. So it's certainly a, a means of decarbonizing. Uh, and if we could reuse existing infrastructure, you know, that may well be, uh, that would be of benefit. And we have to look then, take into account the entire system costs and the entire economics of the supply chain. But I mean, the, as, you, as you said, the, the goal is decarbonization at least cost while maintaining a secure electricity <coughs> sector. And so it's not a question of one of these, but the optimal solution for Ireland, and that, may, that optimal solution may be different uh, to uh, another country. And it may well include biomethane in our gas grid. And one of your earlier studies, Shane, you know, you had the, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions and the big challenge for Ireland, the 33% from the agricultural sector. The, the main greenhouse gas emitted by the agricultural sector, the agricultural sector is methane which when you come to the power generation sector, we call it fuel, you know, so it's kind of, I think you, you made the point there a few times that, you know, we have to look and look at these as challenges that, you know, there are solutions there, not solutions that we have, you know, ready today, but, you know, that is one that is probably staring us straight in the face, but an emissions problem for the agriculture sector may be a solution for power jet, you know, so. Indeed, it may well be. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think we'll have to just halt the questions here. Thank you for everybody, and on behalf of the Energy and Environmental Division, Shane, thank you very much indeed. Now, we do have David Taylor from the Energy Institute to, to, to wrap it up, but could I just say some, just one comment from myself? Would you say it's correct in ballpark terms that to comply with the 2050 to zero carbon, we should be thinking about approximately doubling the price of electricity? Would that be of the order? <laughs> From the figures you've given, like 150, that's 15 cents a kilowatt hour, currently probably seven for generation costs, would it be? Something like that. Okay, well, I suppose there's a few ways to look at this. The, the wholesale electricity cost of your bill is one component. Oh, on so the just, just the wholesale? So the wholesale costs, you know, who's to say what the cost of technologies will be going forward? What I would say is that, um, while maybe electricity will go up, and if you look at the, the maturity of technologies now and, and some of those available, they do seem more expensive uh, than a current option of uh, generating electricity. We also have to factor in account energy efficiency, and then we may find that uh, in the future, while maybe our electricity is more expensive or maybe it's cheaper, but we will hopefully be using less of it uh, in the future. So the impact on your bill could go either way. Unfortunately, my, my crystal ball is, is as broken as yours. <laughs> David. Well, um, on behalf of everybody here present, I'd just like to say a few words of thanks in relation to what we've just heard. I suppose it, it's, it's been a terrific story at several levels. One is the striking gains in the CO2 emission intensity of electricity supply in Ireland over the last 25 years. Um, you've outlined the scale of the challenge of the next 25 years. But it's useful to remember that uh, we actually achieved that with one large, as you said, high emitter on the system delivering benefits right through that period. And of course, yesterday's success, born out of crisis, <laughs> is tomorrow's <laughs> problem. So it's no accident, you know, that there's a lot of public interest in it and a lot of people looking to the ESB for solutions. In a very gentle way, by pointing up the four scenarios and contrasting them, talking us through them, you managed to suggest, for me at least, that the public discourse that's about is it more wind or biomass conversion of money point, I think what you said to me, it's more wind first on economic security of supply and other grounds, and after that, some of these options, among which is the possible conversion of money point. We got two signals from our audience. One was the thinness of the market in biomass and the risks that that carries. And the other was the scale of operations in gas and the benefits that that brings. So I have a feeling that when you come back to talk to us again, you'll be on one of your preferred topics, and it will be about CO2 capture and storage 
and uh, the big resource you may be talking about will be gas and it won't be coming from Europe it'll be coming from you know a large international traded commodity which no one can ignore at their peril in favor of a very thin market to achieve the same end but it's been enormously thought-provoking in a very gentle uh, non-lecturing way and I think you're to be congratulated and on behalf of everybody here present, I'd like to thank you and invite them to join us in expressing a vote of thanks.